good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for being here. Um, I know you had a choice of presentations you could go to. Um, I also want to acknowledge these very clever people uh, and Prof. De Vries, who's my mentor and supervisor, and he'll tell you that there's some anecdotal evidence that I'm able to give a 15-minute presentation in 45 minutes, so <laughs> I better get cracking. Okay, so um, I'm not going to say much about that because we've heard a lot about it. I want to talk about mobile phone technology-based screening tool that could potentially identify children with ASD early, uh, children living in low and middle income countries or low resourced communities. Now, these screening tools or technology-based screening tools firstly need to be accurate. False positives not only cost, waste money, but also drain resources. It needs to be affordable. Um, we know that less than 1% of governmental healthcare budgets are made available for mental health. It needs to be at least as accessible to people living in the Rift Valley um, as it is to people living in Silicon Valley. It needs to be appropriate, not across cultures and languages. Not all cultures um, allow females to have and use mobile phones. Uh, some cultures do not allow videotaping or photographing faces at all. And it needs to be scalable. It needs to grow with the population. We know that um, primary health care interventions and or public health interventions and vaccinations have resulted in kids, specifically in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, now surviving beyond the age of five years. And between one and 68 and one in 100 of these children will be potentially on the spectrum. So for those of you who were not present this morning when Dr. Dawson gave her presentation, um, I will be talking a little bit about the autism and beyond um, iPhone app. For those of you who were there, can be prepared to have your minds blown again. Um, this app was developed by Duke University. Now, it is not a screening tool, but it's at least the first step in developing a scalable tool to quantify autism risk and also potentially provide feedback to uh, parents about their child's development. Now, the Duke, Univ Duke University did a, or conducted a, a population-based study where the Autism and Beyond app was available on the, uh, in the American uh, Apple App Store. Um, parents could download it free of charge. They then accessed the app using a unique username and password and then completed the in-app activities. Now, the first step is a um, self-guided electronic informed consent. This is then followed by questionnaires about the, uh, uh, well, demographic questionnaire and dem uh, questionnaires about the child's development and behavior. And this is then followed by the video assessment section of the app. More about that later. Okay, so how does it work? The child is shown videos uh, on the iPhone while the selfie camera then rec records the child's uh, responses, uh, parents can choose either full face or landmarks only to be uploaded and analyzed later. Automated computer coding then quantifies the child's response. And the idea is then, that by combining analysis of video data with uh, questionnaire data, um, you could potentially identify the risk for autism. OK. so. What are these videos you all want to know? There are three videos of 30, second e 30 seconds each and then a mirror stimulus. Now, they were designed to elicit positive emotions uh, and shared enjoyment as well as attention. I'm going to show you a little clip of uh, the Bubbles video, uh, Toys and Rhyme, and also a weird hopping bunny that I'm sure you all agree has not benefited from veterinary intervention ever. Okay. The mirror stimulus is basically just the selfie camera um, showing an image of the child on the camera's screen, and obviously I can't show you that. Bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Okay, and as she fades away, 
we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so computer vision algorithms uh, detect and track multiple facial uh, landmarks around the eyes and nose and mouth, and that I'll show you now next in a little video, uh, to classify facial emotional expression as well as head position. So let's go to that. So you can see neutral, happy, sad, surprised, and there, which way the head is turning. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our mixed method study where we collected quantitative data to investigate the technical feasibility as well as some qualitative data to determine appropriateness and acceptability of this app. Okay, in phase one, we had to, uh, we had to assess with um, you know, mobile phone ownership as well as access to the internet, internet, uh, uh, internet use and familiarity with their mobile phones. We also needed to test the reliability of these automated computer vision algorithms on African children from, uh, from uh, well, on African children uh, from South Africa. Uh, we had to determine whether or not the quality of videos recorded in a typically South African environment was good enough for automated Gabriel coding. And we had to determine whether or not the video clips designed and produced in the US would elicit similar emotional responses in children from our community setting. And of the, did I mention that we had to, did I mention the reliability of the automated coding? I hope so. I've mentioned it now. Okay, let's go back one. And in phase two, we invited some parents to participate in focus group studies. Uh, so we, you know, get to get their input and ask them what they thought about an app, uh, a smartphone app for observational assessment of young children. And also we had to determine what content needed localization to a South African setting. Okay. So we went to Kayalicha, which is a low-income township about 30 kilometers from Cape Town. Uh, we, by word of mouth, uh, recruited 45 typically developing children between the ages of 12 and 72 months, and their parents were guardians. And our study was uh, conducted in a, you know, in a, a, a typical Kayalicha street this typical Kailicha street, in this typical Kailicha home. And here are some of our participants queuing at the front door, rearing to go and participate or do their bit for scientific endeavor. Okay, in phase one, uh, we asked the parents first to uh, complete informed consent. We then handed them a questionnaire, a paper-based questionnaire to, um, for them to tell us about their mobile phone ownership and use of the internet. Um, they then completed all the in-app activities. Um, after that was completed, I hopped on a couple of planes to uh, Duke University where I first coded some of the videos uh, myself and then we had the uh, we did vi uh, automate, automatic, video, automatic computer coding of all the videos and that was obviously followed by some statistical analysis. Uh, in phase two, we invited 14, two groups of seven of the parents who participated in phase one uh, to participate in, some fo in, in two focus groups and uh, to tell us what they thought about that. They were obviously, again, um, given an informed consent. Okay, and here you can see we're sitting in the living room uh, of this typical Kailicha home. It was a cold winter's morning. There's a paraffin heater, reading the consent forms, enjoying the warm refreshments homemade by our host. That's Eugene and I observing the parent uh, using the app, uh, Eugene observing the parent, and the child there, I don't know if you can see it, observing Eugene. <laughs> okay, so in the end, 37 children uh, met the inclusion criteria, um, 20 boys, 16 girls, and one where the parent did not tell us the sex of the child, um, aged between 14 and 72 months, with a mean age of 40 months, here you can see the results of our technology questionnaire. Most of our parents owned a smartphone. Interestingly enough, no, but not one of the parents owned an iPhone. Uh, most of them used mobile phone data to access the internet. They, some of them, at least half of them, purchased and downloaded apps, and most felt that they were pretty good 
with using their phones. Okay, so here it shows that a middle-aged veterinarian from Friarook is almost as good as recognizing smiley faces and children as this computer with an ICC of 95%. Okay, the next thing we had to do is we had to compare the results or, or the responses of uh, our children with a age and gender matched, matched group of uh, American children um, with regards to their reaction to the videos. And specifically, we measured time or uh, compared uh, percentage time attending, in other words, looking at the screen, and the percentage time smiling. So here you can see that there was no statistically significant difference between the time spent looking at the screen for the Bubbles video, and in fact, this was the case for all of the videos. The Bubbles video, uh, Bunny, uh, Toys and Rhymes, as well as the uh, Mirror Stimulus. With regards to the Bubbles video and the Mirror vi video, there was also no difference in the percentage time smiling or positive emotion. However, <coughs> the Bunny, the story is slightly different. As I said, no difference in the time looking at the screen. However, it seems that there was a that the American children, uh, as, a, as a group, um, had a greater uh, percentage time smiling while watching. So they, more of them smiled than uh, when compared to the South African group, as well as with the Toys and Rhyme. Again, they're statistically significant, greater percentage time smiling in the USA sample. Okay. So the focus groups, um, what parents have to say. I'm going to just play one audio clip of what one parent had to say. Um, you can read it as well, but um, let's see if we can hear what he has had said. Can you play? Um, I think it's great because um, it notifies us, it, not, it notifies us about our children and um, it can be used at home and schools and most of the time in these health facilities you will find that they are choose and it's long, you can't even stand there for hours. So it's better to see your child at home of like, what, is he okay or is he okay? And um, I recommend it, yeah, mm. it's very nice. Okay, so pretty positive. I can think you can imagine that in some countries, um, for parents to get to services, they, they travel days, not hours. And then they sometimes have to wait days, not hours, to, to get some help. So what did we learn from the study? Well, firstly, we can say that it seems that the app is techni technically accurate. For it to be affordable, the parents told us that the app needed to be free. And um, they also would prefer it to be free, the data that they use to be free as well. Um, accessibility for people, for parents to, to, to be able to use this app, they require a mobile phone, they require a smartphone. Um, now, most of them, as we, we show, do own a smartphone, but we don't necessarily know whether or not the phones that they have, the, you know, the, um, if the camera would allow good enough quality videos to be recorded for it to be analog. Um, you have to have um, the technical specs of a, of a mobile phone, of an iPhone at least. Um, appropriate, well, most of the parents were quite happy using it and they said that they would recommend it to their friends. Scalability of this app, well, I think that would be the subject of a larger study. As I said, we, we don't know whether or not the phones that, that, that are, and there are many, you know, smartphones are becoming more and more, uh, are becoming cheaper and cheaper and more and more available, as well as um, access to, to um, broadband mobile phone data across this continent. But whether or not the phones would be capable of giving us good quality video, that we don't know. Thank you. <laughs> 